as I've been introduced, I'm working with the Extractive Hub, but I'm also uh, actively involved with the African Energy and Minerals Management Initiative as the founder and executive director. And I've authored several books with respect to energy and mining, including the one which is relevant to this webinar, which is Mining and the in Africa, Exploring the Social and Environmental Impact. And also another book that is really relevant for this webinar is my upcoming book on land access and extractives in Africa. And this will be published by the Hart Publishers uh, who are based in London. Though I'm also actively involved in the energy sector with several publications, including the two books on energy access in Africa and also energy transitions in Africa. So with respect to construction minerals, we have to understand some key facts so that we appreciate the reason as to why we really need to pay close attention to legislate and also govern and manage construction minerals on the African continent. So the first issue being the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal 11 emphasizes the need for sustainable cities and communities. And with all the aspects to do with cities or communities or buildings, we notice that construction minerals, including sand and, and gravel, they play a major role in urbanization. So construction minerals are key in the achievement of the SDG 11, one of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Now, we also notice that minerals are used in different sectors as raw materials. But in most cases, when we're talking about minerals, we tend to focus on precious minerals, including gold, silver. And this explains the reasons to why it has taken us a lot of time, especially in African countries or developing countries, to even set up laws legislating construction minerals, because we're used to this uh, saying that a mineral or minerals, it's mostly gold, silver, or other precious minerals, but that's not the issue. And in the 21st century, we really need to pay close attention to construction minerals because they also play a major role in the, uh, in, in the economic development. Now, another thing or another key fact that really puts the issue of construction minerals at the center in the 21st century is the fact that urbanization is expected to escalate globally, especially in, on the African continent, as we notice that two, two billion people are likely to live in urban centers and Africa, and one third of that two billion will be coming from the African continent. So with urbanization comes the need for construction minerals, including sand, because it's key in the construction of the cities, the construction of infrastructure, uh, just to mention but a few. But besides the issue of urbanization, we also noticed that in 2040, 9.2 billion people, uh, like population growth will increase uh, to nearly 9.2 billion people in 2040. So that's also an issue because with population growth, we noticed that many people will have to, they will need construction minerals to build their houses, also cities, uh, the infrastructure. So that also puts the construction minerals into perspective and the reason as to why we really need to pay extra attention in the legislation and governance of construction minerals. Now, um, uh, another issue we have to, we, I don't want to go into detail of what construction minerals are, but just a brief, they include sand, gravel, clay and granite. And like I mentioned in the past, most developing countries haven't been paying extra attention to construction mineral or building materials. And as such, these were not included in our mining legislations. Uh, still to put the subject into perspective, uh, these are some of the key sectors that are likely to, to be of importance or to play a, a central role in 2040. And we see the transport sector and the issue of construction minerals will come in because obviously with transport, we we'll need the infrastructure, including roads, railways. And then that means that construction minerals will still play a major role. And then another, I'll, I'll skip the industry and just put building, like I mentioned, urbanization is, is, is estimated to escalate. 
and also 90% of urban expect, uh, expansion is estimated to be in developing countries like I mentioned. And currently, what is worrying, especially in developing countries, is the fact that it's, uh, it's, uh, 828 million people are uh, expected to still live in, in slums in developing countries. So that means we'll need more construction minerals to ensure that we take out these 828 million people from slums to go to uh, urban centers or sustainable cities. And like I also mentioned, nine, nine out of 10 mega cities are expected to be in, developing, in the developing world. So this puts into perspective the crucial role of construction minerals and not to mention the fact that um, recently the UN report uh, estimates show that uh, currently the global demand for sand and gravel is that it stands at 40 to 50 billion tons per year. So that demand also indicates that right now it's just at 40 to 50 billion tons, but with all the estimated urbanization, population growth and industrialization, this number is likely to double or even triple. Now, um, also the report goes further to indicate that sand and gravel are the second largest resources extracted and traded by volume after water. So with all these developments, or with all these facts and data we're seeing, it shows that we really need to pay extra attention to the legislation of construction minerals, which most countries have done, uh, obviously. Like uh, South Africa was one of the African countries to really pay close attention to construction minerals, as we saw in their analysis in 2012, where they had a report by the Ministry, the, by the, by the Minister of, of Mines and Petroleum. And also we've, had, we've seen efforts to legislate the construction industry or construction minerals in the country. But however, as I'll be outlining in the research, there are several issues with the aspect of legislation of construction minerals, specifically in developing countries, because uh, my, uh, my co-presenter, uh, Mr. Peter Morgan, will be taking us through the aspect of legislation in the UK, and we noticed that's a developed country, so the issues they're experiencing are totally different from what we're experiencing. But besides uh, my research, I've also done field work, uh, field work trips, where I've interviewed some people who are involved in stone quarrying. Like here, I was interviewing the women to find out the challenges women face in the stone quarrying sector. And then here, I was interviewing the men to clearly understand the challenges they face in the stone quarrying sector. And then in this photo, um, <clears throat> through the initiative, the Emmy initiative, we noticed that most of the people who are involved in stone quarrying, they don't have protective gears. So these gloves and the boats were provided by the NGO we're working with. So you see, you notice or you, you realize that what's in the field is totally different from what balsamicas are doing. And we really need to take the realities of the issue of construction minerals if we are to get effective laws and regulations with respect to construction minerals. So the key issue here from my fieldwork research is <clears throat> when legislating on construction minerals or building materials, we have to take into consideration the differences between small scale and industrial stone quarrying, which in most mining laws we call small uh, artisanal mining and also large scale mining. And also the other issue that is really important is the issue of ownership of minerals. Because we noticed in most mining legislations or mining acts, the ownership of minerals is vested in the government. But with the issue of construction minerals, there is uh, an ongoing debate. Like if governments in African countries are trying to legislate on construction minerals, does it mean that it's like construction minerals should be defined or legislated as the general minerals, including the precious minerals like gold, uh, copper, silver, or should we have a special law just focused on legislating construction minerals? So uh, before I go any further, I need to emphasize the issue of ownership as being key with respect to legislation of construction minerals, and also the fact that there is a major difference between 
precious minerals and construction minerals or building materials. And we can also not underestimate the crucial role of building materials or construction minerals in urbanization, population growth, and industrialization on the African continent. So moving forward, I would like to <clears throat> highlight some of the specific challenges that are uh, that are really focused on construction minerals that might differ from other types of minerals, including precious minerals. So with the issue of sand mining, we noticed that <clears throat> there is um, an escalated illegal activity with sand mining, and this has escalated crime and violence in different countries, including in South Africa and Uganda, we've seen some instances of crime and violence. In Ghana, we've seen some instances of crime and violence, just all on the basis of sand mining. And also with the move to legislate or, or regulate construction minerals, we've seen a rise in corruption, especially on the part of government officials who might uh, openly ignore uh, companies who are not complying with the mining permits or licenses, especially involved in sand mining. And also we cannot underestimate the environmental and social impacts that are associated with construction minerals, especially sand mining. So we noticed that most African countries or developing countries, even though some countries like South Africa, they tried to put up legislation to uh, govern construction minerals, they still, they still lack effective policies and also institutions to ensure that these materials or minerals are fully governed uh, now I'll, I'll take you through the initiatives that are going on at uh, international level. Like I mentioned in the past, not a lot of attention has been given to construction minerals because we've been focusing on precious minerals. And this explains also why at an international level, we haven't or we don't have any international legislation that is targeted to construction minerals. However, recently in 2019, uh, based on the UN resolution on minerals resources governance, the UNEP report recommended that there, there needs to be um, an international in initiative that has standard global rules on sand mining governance and management. And this is basically due to the fact that they noticed that transboundary nature of some construction minerals, especially sand mining. So at the international level, we haven't yet seen, uh, we haven't yet got a law that is specifically focused on construction minerals. We have general laws on minerals, but as I mentioned, at the national level, most laws or mining acts were not putting into consideration or they were not including construction minerals as part of uh, minerals generally. So that, in, that implies that even at the international level, the resolutions, the UN resolutions or the various acts at, on the African continent or even at the regional level, because at the regional level we have the, an initiative like the European Aggregates Association. We also have this global aggregates information network, but this, these are just voluntary initiatives. So we are yet to see something that is solid at an international level or global level with respect to construction minerals. But however, note that just with respect to minerals generally, we do have several international uh, instruments or laws with respect to governing the mining sector or natural resources generally. But something specific to construction minerals, we don't have something yet, but hopefully with the UNEP report, we shall be able to have uh, a global law governing the sand mining sector. Now, uh, this brings me to the show on the national level, specifically I'll focus on the African experience. So what is the problem at the national level? Because we've seen, like I mentioned, some countries like South Africa, they've been taking the issue of construction minerals seriously, and they've been able to legislate on construction minerals. But however, we've seen criticism, especially in South Africa, where uh, like the South African uh, Aggregate Association had to, in 2015, they raised concern that the legislation of construction minerals in the country it's not, it's not being relevant because 
in the act, uh, construction minerals are being treated as precious minerals, and this, can't, this cannot work in any way. Because like I mentioned, the construction mineral sector is dominated by small-scale miners or small-scale enterprises. So financially and technically, these cannot be treated as the big mining companies or gold, gold companies, um, silver or copper. So that there is an issue of distinguishing between construction minerals and precious minerals in the African legislations. So I'll take you through the example from Uganda. Because in Uganda, uh, the previous mining acts they didn't take into consideration the issue of construction minerals, and as such, um, the constitution under Article Two Four Four Clause One, uh, although it uh, it vests ownership of all minerals in the government, under Clause Five it excludes building materials from the definition of minerals. So that implies that legislation of construction minerals or even ownership of construction minerals in Uganda was not really fully legislated. However, uh, we've seen uh, uh, initiatives or even efforts in Uganda through the mining and minerals policy of 2018 and also the recent bill, 2019 bill, where they're proposing uh, to include construction minerals to, as part of minerals generally. But however, this has also raised some concern because if we are to consider construction minerals to be under minerals generally or building materials like sand to be defined and, as minerals, that means that the ownership of these minerals, of construction minerals, will be vested in the government. But remember, for decades, these minerals or materials have been privately owned. So the issues with respect to the ownership of minerals, it's a big issue in African countries because it's not about legislating and saying, okay, construction minerals are now under the Mining Act. We have to uh, treat, the, to treat the owners or the companies involved in these minerals the way we are, we are treating gold companies or uh, copper or even silver companies. So that's an issue of concern because we have to take into consideration issues concerning land ownership and also ownership of minerals. Should it be private or public? And this is one thing we really, really need to take into consideration if we are to fully benefit from the construction minerals. I also note in, in 2016, uh, Kenya adopted their Mining Act and under section six, they talk about ownership of minerals to also be vested in the government. But we also noticed that Kenya, uh, through this Mining Act, they defined minerals to also include construction minerals. So the issue of ownership is key. And also the issue of distinguishing between precious minerals and construction minerals is very key if we're to effectively legislate uh, the construction mineral sector on, Afri in, on the African continent. With that background, uh, the question arises as to what are the key considerations in legislating construction minerals in developing countries. First and foremost, like I mentioned, we have to take into consideration the fact that now construction minerals are cross-boundary. Because you notice, especially with the issue of sand mining, there's some countries that are not really endowed with sand, but they still need sand for their um, their construction industry. So you will see lots of countries where there is an export and import of sand. I'll take an example like um, in Uganda, we've seen many Chinese companies being involved in sand mining. And I know, I know that sand is not only used for the construction industry, it's also used in making glasses. So the transboundary character of some construction minerals, especially sand mining, calls into action the issue of regionalism. Because like I mentioned, we have some international initiatives to uh, legislate on construction of minerals, but at the regional level, do we have any standards or rules to legislate construction minerals? And the answer is no. And there's no way we're going to see international initiatives or international instruments being implemented at the national level, yet even 
national governments, they lack direction on how to legislate on construction minerals. And also at the, region, at the regional level, we need to see more laws that are focused on legislating and governing construction minerals. And also the other issue, like I mentioned, is, is the issue of ownership. Should we put the ownership under the government for construction minerals? The answer to me, in my opinion, it would be no, because for decades, the, these minerals, as we've seen even in other uh, jurisdictions, they have been privately owned. So putting the construction minerals under the government will increase corruption, and we also lack the necessary institutions to manage the to manage or even government construction minerals. So we have to prepare ourselves both uh, institutionally and also um, legally or in terms of re uh, regulation so that before we, we put the construction minerals under the government, we are sure that they will be fully legislated. But also we have to note the important role of construction minerals, like I mentioned. So what will happen if these minerals are governed by the government? That means some people will not be able to uh, easily build, because like I mentioned, many people, uh, small scale enterprises are involved in the construction of these minerals or in the, in, in, in the ownership and management of these minerals. So that will bring in a lot of issues. So we have to take into consideration the issue of uh, ownership also land rights and social license to operate. When we are legislating, we have to ensure that the companies, even the small scale companies, do acquire the social license to operate. How are they treating the local communities? Like in, the, in some countries I've visited to do my field work research, you notice that most of the communities where sand is extracted from, they don't even have good buildings there. So what, what, what's the use of getting the sand out of those communities when they don't even have buildings? So we have to really take into consideration those issues. And also the aspect of gender equality. Like I mentioned in my field work, uh, you notice that women were not benefiting as much as the men with respect to construction minerals. So we have to pay extra attention to those issues. And also another key consideration is the unique challenges for small scale and large scale enterprises that are involved in construction minerals. Because you'll notice that in stone quarrying, most of the companies, foreign companies that are involved in stone quarrying, they have the equipment, <coughs> the necessary equipment and capital. But most of the small enterprises that are involved, they lack this equipment, they don't have protective gears, the the fault is at risk also and also the environment is at risk. So some those are some some of the key issues we really have to put into consideration. And also we need to distinguish the difference between precious minerals and construction minerals. And we set up laws that are favorable with respect to rehabilitation and mining closure in the event that maybe a sand mining site has to close in virtually. And also we have to ask ourselves if we put construction minerals as part of minerals generally, will some of these small enterprises have the financial guarantees that are needed for land rehabilitation as we see in the governance or legislation of other minerals like precious minerals. And also laws have to provide for local development like I mentioned. We shouldn't see communities where sand or even quarries are being um, mined from to be the least developed without any reasonable buildings, because that goes against the whole purpose of construction minerals, which is to ensure sustainable cities. So those are basically the key considerations from me, and I'll let Peter go on with his presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Victoria. I think I speak for everyone when I say we took so much away from that. And just a reminder to the audience, please, if you have any questions to address to our speakers, please just write them in the Q&A. I know that I have at least five questions coming from that really interesting presentation. So now I'll hand over to Peter Morgan. I introduced him in the beginning. Peter will be speaking about the UK position and giving us a great idea from a you know great is great ideas from a developed country so without further ado peter please please start okay thank you uh, 
very much, J Jackie, and thanks, uh, Victoria. Um, despite what I thought at the beginning, there's a lot of synergies and similarities um, between um, what Victoria has said and what I'm going to say. And um, I'm going to alter my presentation uh, as I go along now to try and bring out some of those, uh, some of those issues. Before I start, though, I'll just stress that I'm, although I've got a master's in mineral law and policy, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, and I suspect most of the audience are lawyers. Okay, th this is essentially uh, what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to make some uh, introductory remarks and some basic principles so um, everyone understands what I'll be talking about. I'll give uh, what will now be a very brief overview of the situation um, in the UK. Um, I'll then go on to talk about the policy and planning system for construction aggregates as it operates in the UK. And then at the end, uh, just raise some uh, policy issues. I think there are some other things that are relevant perhaps to the audience that I won't be, uh, be presenting like ASA, ASM, restoration guarantees, environmental taxes and community benefits. They're all very topical, but um, maybe we can pick those up um, uh, in, in the questions. Uh, I put some websites up there as well. If anyone wants to follow up on anything on the UK, those websites are very, uh, very useful. Just for clarity, um, what I'm going to be talking about is natural primary um, aggregates in terms of crushed rock and land worn sand and gravel. Um, I won't be talking about marine sand and gravel, which is about 6% of the UK market. And I won't be talking about recycled or secondary aggregates, um, which represent about 30%. Um, I'm just talking about primary land worn um, aggregates, which are crushed rock and sand and gravel. In terms of the policy side of things, I'm, I'm going to focus on the situation in England, um, because there are some slight variations in Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland that collectively make up the United Kingdom. And in terms of terminology, um, I'll, be, I'll be referring to mines, quarries and sites interchangeably. Um, construction minerals are uh, extracted by surface mining or open pit mining, but um, in the UK we tend to use the term quarry or even site, so just out of habit, if you hear me talk about a mine, a quarry or a site, I'm talking about the same thing. This ties in uh, quite a bit now, which I didn't realise at the time, with what um, <clears throat> Victoria was saying about um, ownership and uh, legislation. In the UK, um, essentially, the legislation is, uh, in terms of ownership is part state and part private, uh, but in terms of construction minerals, it is private. Um, but we also have development rights, which are uh, controlled by the state based on national policy, which is administered at um, a local level. So regardless of the ownership, and in construction minerals, it's essentially private, um, you can't extract any minerals without the development rights, and you get them from the state. Um, and it's those development rights or that system that I'm largely going to be talking about. Um, before I do though, this is just uh, to illustrate um, the acqui typical acquisition of what I call the property right. Um, uh, it should be very similar to what happens in, in, in most countries, albeit on a different legal system. But we have a, an exploration license. Um, you might call it a, a prospecting license, depending on the, the extent of the known geology and the works um, included. Um, or uh, more commonly, an exploration license, which incorporates an option to take a lease. Um, this gives the, uh, the mining company or operator some security of tenure and um, continuity whilst he or they progress the, um, the, 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 the development right application to get what is called a planning permission. This is just a, a typical quarry for those that might not be um, familiar with them in the UK. Um, but again, I just want to deal with some um, concepts in that um, unlike other forms of development and built development and land use, minerals can only be worked where they exist. Therefore, the base starting point is the geology. Um, 
And as we know, all resources are not evenly distributed um, around any particular country. So there is a lot of uh, transportation between, between certain the UK, between regions, uh, which is a function of the underlying geology. Um, minerals are a wasting asset in that um, once they're exhausted in any particular location, they, they need to be replaced by suitable resources elsewhere. Otherwise, you, you're not going to get any ongoing uh, sustainable development. There will be um, an interference in the supply to uh, meet the construction market demand. Um, and the other characteristic, particularly of construction minerals, is that they are relatively low value, but high volume and high weight. So transport costs are critical. And generally, you want your sources of supply close to uh, the, uh, where the demand is in the construction markets. Uh, because certainly in the UK, uh, the transport limit by truck is probably about 50 kilometres or 30 miles. Um, again, just to give context to the UK industry, there are something like 250 hard rock quarries and 250 sand and gravel quarries um, in the country uh, with associated asphalt, concrete and mortar plants. Uh, UK's largest self-sufficient in their construction uh, mineral requirements. Um, the industry itself um, now comprises uh, a number of major international companies, but also a number of um, smaller national and local companies, um, some of which would probably qualify uh, in the category of AVSM. And again, just to give it context, um, the typical life of a sand and gravel operation in the UK is 10 to 20 years sometimes longer, and the typical life of a crushed rock aggregates quarry is probably 20 years uh, or even decades. Um, the quarry on the picture there has been a quarry in that location for the best part of a century. Um, uh, that is a large quarry by UK standards and probably does about a million tonnes a year. Um, it currently has permitted reserves for at least another 30 years as well, with potential for extensions after that. This is a, a picture of the same quarry, just from a different direction. Um, I was going to point out various issues, but I think I might be short of time, so I won't bother other than to say there is some progressive restoration there. Um, this is the processing plant with a, an asphalt plant and a concrete plant. Um, it's close to main, uh, main haulage routes there, it's a motorway. That's a, a large sand and gravel site as well. Um, things to note there, is um, they have a block making plant, so they make concrete blocks as well as produce um, aggregate. Um, the area there is all progressive restoration. So whilst they're still working, and they'll be working here for about another 10 years um, over in this area, um, they do progressively restore back to agricultural land as they go. That's just a different shot of um, a, a quarry similar to the first one. That, that one's located maybe five miles or so from the, from the first quarry, uh, almost an identical operation. Um, and just to illustrate the point on um, transport and impact, the first quarry there on a good year can do about a million tonnes a year. And um, before I came on, I just analysed that myself back to uh, lorry movements and impact. And essentially, if you assume a 20 tonne payload per truck um, and each lorry load accounts for two movements, that's one movement in and one movement out, um, uh, you've got uh, a lorry travelling uh, about once every minute. So if you're a local resident living close by on the road network, you're going to have a lorry uh, running past your house um, on average every minute for eight to ten hours a day, five days a week which in a, in a quiet country location is quite an impact. Um, this just shows the breakdown, um, some, uh, an earlier slide. Um, total aggregates uh, in the UK is about 250 million tonnes a year, of which 30% uh, is uh, recycled in secondary. Uh, if you go back 20 or 30 years, that would have been a very, very small proportion. But because of um, the various uh, environmental taxes and so on, uh, there's been a massive increase in the use of secondary and recycled aggregates to supply the market. 70% um, is uh, natural uh, aggregate comprising um, of, of that 70%. 65% is crushed rock, um, igneous 
uh, sandstone, limestone and the like. The other 35% is sand and gravel, of which um, a small proportion represents 6% of the total is marine. This just gives um, a rough breakdown in tonnage terms of the, of, of the types of uses um, uh, as between sand and gravel and crushed rock. Uh, you can see the majority of the crushed rock is used as a road stone, uh, a building stone, railway ballast, whereas the vast majority of the sand and gravel is used in, in, in concrete and, uh, and similar things. This just illustrates the typical uh, use for different buildings. Um, you know, for a school, about 15,000 tonnes of concrete typically. Uh, a hospital, 53,000 tonnes of concrete. Uh, I've got that in just purely for, uh, for illustration. Looking at values, um, this just, again, just gives a, a, an idea on the val uh, value added of, uh, of the products um, in the UK economy uh, that uh, collectively uh, amount to about five and a half billion uh, pounds uh, in terms of main products. And that just gives a, a glance at the industry. Um, annual turnover, about 18 billion. It's... Uh, by far the largest uh, minerals industry uh, in the UK. It employs about 74,000 people and about three and a half million people in, in related jobs uh, in the supply chain. Looking at this, uh, the, 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 the planning uh, system, which is um, the system uh, that we use in the UK by which you obtain your development right, as opposed to your property right, um, uh, it's based on town and country planning system. Uh, that system has been in place since about 1945, 1946. Um, in terms of, and it covers all development and land use. Um, and uh, in terms of aggregates, um, the UK adopted a, a managed aggregate, aggregate supply system uh, about 30, 35 years ago. And that really is the basis by which um, the, the, the whole system of policy and legislation has developed um, around um, the development rights to uh, f uh, to extract and work um, aggregates. Um, it follows uh, from a national policy that identifies the need to be a steady and an adequate supply uh, to sustain the economic growth in the construction industry. And it does that through uh, what we call the managed aggregate supply system. Um, and that uh, essentially decisions are made at a local level, but it is to meet uh, a, a national strategy and a, a national um, process because um, as I think we identified earlier, um, some areas are relatively resource rich. Um, other areas have a greater need than they can supply themselves. So there is a lot of interregional uh, transfer and transport um, between resource-rich areas and, and areas of use. It's not very clear, but it, it's clear enough in that um, the one on the left is the interregional uh, transfer of crushed rock. And some of the highlights are that um, the southwest here supplies huge quantities into London and the southeast that don't have any. Again, it's a function of geology. Um, the backbone of Britain here, the Pennines and so on, where there is a lot of hard rock, means that the uh, the sort of the, the East Midlands and the Pennines supply into the conurbations of the, the Northwest, like Manchester, and into the West Midlands conurbations around Birmingham, um, and also down into areas like Norfolk, where again the, the, there is no there is no rock resources. Um, it's a bit more straightforward for sand and gravel. Sand and gravel is fairly widespread, but again, you can see that the huge market in the London area is supplied from elsewhere. Um, there are some limited imports, but we are largely self-sufficient. So this is back to the, to, to, to the system. So essentially, um, the managed aggregate supply system um, relies on local authorities assessing supply and demand in their areas um, by an annual review that then feeds into a regional aggregate working party, which tends to be a number of authorities that cover a region. And they look at both local issues and national issues 
and assess the supply and demand that is required um, regionally. Um, that feeds down to um, a land bank situation per mineral authority, which is usually a, a county in the UK. Um, and that says that uh, counties need to maintain a minimum of uh, 10 years of permitted reserves of crushed rock and a minimum of seven years permitted reserves of sand and gravel within their area. Uh, and they use that as the basis to uh, identify in minerals uh, development plans an allocation of sites to, to meet that requirement. So if, if a particular county is currently sat on, say, 15 years of reserves, it wouldn't be too much of a rush to allocate more sites. But if, on the other hand, um, they were down to maybe five, six, seven years, they would have to allocate other sites that met all the environmental and other criteria within that development plan. And that gives some certainty um, to the industry as well as to uh, the locals in, in, in any particular area as to what, what is going to happen. Um, the means by which the development right is obtained is uh, via an application called uh, an application for a planning permission, which is your, if you like, your development permit. Uh, that is submitted to the uh, county council, which is the mineral planning authority. And there are about 50 of those uh, in England. Um, and that is uh, vetted and validated and then sent out for consultation both to various government um, departments um, and also to the public and community groups. All that feedback is taken into account as well as uh, the, the various policies within the, the, the mineral development plan um, by technical officers within that authority. They then make a recommendation for approval or refusal and that is determined by uh, elected councillors, politicians, uh, and they decide whether they go with the recommendation uh, and grant it or they refuse it. Uh, the permits have numerous conditions attached. Um, and if a site is refused unreasonably, uh, a mining company has a right to appeal that uh, to, to central government. Um, so that was quite a quick trot through it, but um, I hope people get the gist of how the system works. Um, all applications for planning permission require uh, an environmental impact assessment and all the associated things that go along with that. Uh, and that, this one, um, I'm just highlighting some of the policy issues that we can consider, maybe deal with them during the, the, the question time. As I said, um, it, it's about construction market demand and location of suitable resources to, to, to feed that, having regard to transport in particular. Uh, on the environmental side, uh, there's all the usual, but something that we have in the UK is called an aggregate tax, which is a, effectively an environmental taxation on primary um, aggregates. Um, there are lots of social and human issues, um, but both uh, positive and negative, jobs and so on. But again, um, in the UK, we have uh, community liaison uh, groups and community trust funds, uh, which provide benefits. And tying in again with Victoria on an institutional basis, there is the, the institutional capacity in terms of uh, expertise and skilled staff to deal with these very complex technical issues. And uh, mine monitoring and compliance is a huge issue that even in the UK uh, has led to some very serious problems. Thank you so much, Peter, really. I think I speak for everyone when I say that was such a thought-provoking presentation. So I see that we've had so many questions, so I'm just going to go straight to our Q&A so that we can get in as many as possible. But again, thank you very much. So the first question is for you, Dr. Nalule. What happens in the case where there is an occurrence of a natural disaster which has a fix of moving these construction, construction minerals from one boundary to the other between countries which have no legislation on international law? Uh, that's why I said uh, currently we lack region laws with respect to construction minerals. So at the moment, we have to take initiatives to develop a regional policy that governs construction minerals because, God forbid, in case, so, in case such a disaster happens, 
we noticed that there might be issues of transboundary trade or even movement of construction minerals. Because in Uganda, we haven't yet legislated upon construction minerals. In Kenya, we are seeing they've legislated on that issue. So we need a regional policy with respect to construction minerals. And also we have to make sure that the national policies or national laws they are in line with the regional policy. And like I mentioned, even if at the international level, we're seeing initiatives to legislate on construction minerals, it cannot be effective if we are seeing lots of confusion at the national level and we're seeing uh, legal and regulatory gaps or even institutional gaps at a regional level. So we need to move forward with the issue of construction minerals. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Morgan, we've got a question for you. You mentioned in your presentation that transport costs are an important factor in this industry. So, and that the, and that the, as the materials cannot be transported far to market, does this mean that there is no import export market for construction minerals? Um, there, is, there is an import export market. Um, it depends um, what the particular construction mineral is and its overall value. Um, but uh, the UK exports um, some construction minerals to Europe, uh, and there are some that comes in from Europe. The part of the problem with the UK is uh, we're, we're an island, um, and uh, therefore uh, any import or export has to go on a ship and, and so on. Whereas I think within mainland Europe, as an alternative example, there is a, a lot more cross border trade because um, their the, the boundaries are, are you know, adjacent, neighbouring. And I think that would probably apply to um, Africa as well, depending again on the geology um, location of resources uh, in relation to the demand. Okay. Thank you very much. I think we've got time for one more question to each of you, even though there are so many questions. And thank you very much to the audience. Um, Vic Dr. Victoria, in your opinion, and considering Africa's legal regime, what ownership option would you opt for? Private ownership or state ownership of construction minerals? Um, I would opt for private ownership, but however, with some reservations. Like I mentioned, uh, it's not like before where we are not paying extra attention to construction minerals. These minerals, um, they have a crucial role to play on the African continent continent come 2040 with the issue of uh, urbanization, industrialization, and population growth. And in the past, we've seen that, yes, it was under private ownership, and we're seeing lots of local councils or even uh, governance at the, local, at the local level. But they are, they lack expertise, and also they lack both uh, the education and technical expertise to govern these minerals. So the government should be involved in a way that it offers a, um, a role of a supervisor. It supervises the, the, the issue of construction minerals, even if it's privately owned. And that includes uh, the issue of taxation regime. How are we benefiting from these minerals? Because yes, uh, in the past they've been privately owned, but the government hasn't been getting the revenue. And also the issue of environment. Can the government come in as a central body to govern or even uh, supervise the environmental regulation or even uh, ensuring that these private companies do comply with the national environmental laws. So it can be privately owned, but the government has to step up and play a crucial role of supervising the issue of construction minerals. Thank you very much. Last question, and this is addressed to Peter. Peter, you... Uh, the audience has asked, you mentioned that there were some environmental taxes that are specific to, to construction minerals in, in the UK. Could you speak a, a bit more on these or the specifically around any environmental concerns when it comes to, to construction minerals? Yeah, the, uh, the environmental tax I referred to is called the aggregates tax. Uh, that was introduced maybe 20 years or so ago. Um, it's levied at a standard rate of two pounds per ton, which is quite significant. Um, and the intention is that it was to encourage um, the use of secondary and recycled materials um, for, for, for aggregates, because um, primary land-worn aggregates 
have environmental consequences and need to be conserved as far as possible. Uh, hence the tax, that increases the price. Uh, when weighed against uh, recycled or uh, secondary aggregates that do not have the levy uh, uh, against them. And that aggregates levy is generally used for um, community benefits and other projects within the vicinity of any particular quarry. Uh, not exclusively for that, but uh, uh, it is fed back into the system for community benefits. Okay. Thank you so much, Peter. We have, we have so many more questions and I think that both I and the audience would just be able to listen to this all day. But unfortunately, we seem to, we've got two more minutes left. So with that, I'm just going to take this opportunity to thank firstly the audience for your attendance and to thank both of our esteemed speakers, Victoria and Peter, you've left us all with so many insights and so much to think about. But unfortunately, given the timing, we have, to, we have to say goodbye. So thank you very much to everyone, to our esteemed speakers. I hope you have a wonderful rest of the day. It's been an honor to spend this hour with you. This webinar is now officially closed. <laughs>